it should start okay then i got it okay so in a nutshell what i'm going to do is to tell you that the reverse field pinch is an mcd equilibrium configuration that you have studied uh, in the books in magnetic confinement which is found essentially in two limiting states an axisymmetric reverse uh, field pinch state which is the one which used to be known uh, since in 2000s i'm saying and uh, the newly discovered helically symmetric reverse field pinch which is new actually which is covered in the last review basically and all of this relies on the fact that the steady state inductive omics sustainment of an rfp is not possible in axisymmetric geometry whenever you get it uh, in, in place uh, then it will diffuse away and so no way uh, it cannot be really axisymmetric so some kind of 3d geometry is required in order to, to, to keep it sustained now the point is the plasma self-organizes itself with some outside help that i will clarify to reach stable conditions in two ways so in axisymmetric geometry well uh, the 3D, the required 3D geometry is supplied by some MHD turbulence or MHD modes. These were the old ideas that provide sustainment. But uh, with this view and this approach, the plasma is intrinsically chaotic and with modest confinement, basically. While in helical geometry, only a single saturated uh, MHD global mode can deform the plasma and provide the, the degree of 3D geometry required for sustainment. This is basically ideas and now we will go through. Now, uh, what I'm going to touch is in, in, in four parts. So about the basic axisymmetric RFP properties and some terminology just to understand what is the bibliography about uh, the axisymmetric RFPs. And then in the second part, I will uh, deal with the experimental phenomenology of global modes uh, and uh, in the multiple HD regime and the, the quasi single helicity regimes. Now, let me start from the name of the, of the configuration. This is basically is too obvious that you have already studied, but the reverse pin pinch inherits its name from the old Z pinch effects. So the old Z pinch uh, um, experiments in which uh, <coughs> we had, uh, you had the self constriction of unidirectional currents due to the current that you are, that you are induced in, in, in a discharge. And so you have, you have this very high beta because it's possible to be obtained in these discharges due to the fact that the plasma confines itself through J cross B. Beta was very high, so it was very promising, but unfortunately it was very violently unstable. And uh, what happens is that in the uh, high plasma currents, uh, a non axisymmetric deformation uh, of a plasma current grows exponentially and eventually terminates the discharge. And this is happening on the time scales of the alpha N waves, which is uh, uh, in the time scale of a microseconds uh, for the time being, uh, for the, the size and densities that were available at that time. We are in the 60s, basically. And uh, they had to develop the diagnostics uh, very fast in order to, to see what was going on. And what I'm showing here is the first ever picture of a, of a kink mode, actually, in the Aldemaston uh, old pinch. And uh, it was actually a kink instability. So it was an M equal one deformation, but there were also M equal zeros. M equal one and M equal zeros are modes that are still affecting RFPs, but not this kind of ones. The time scale is important because actually the microseconds was such that uh, it was dedicated to very to an electrical engineering laboratories in which they were able to develop a very fast discharges. In fact, Padua was an electrical engineering uh, department. Uh, and that's why they actually developed to took the RFP research. <clears throat> now, in order to stabilize it, another simple thing that you can find in textbooks is that the idea was to add an external toroidal field, so a moderate toroidal field, actually, in order to, to try to see, to stabilize this, more, this ideal mode based on the ideas that were available at that time. And uh, by using, by, by analyzing what exactly you can do with Ohm, <coughs> with Ohm's law, you, you can write down the equilibrium of a, of a pinch, uh, which is driven by, um, by the simple of the simplest Ohm law, actually the uh, transport coefficient to have been 
developed in the 50s, in the 40s, so they were ready available. And now, in order to build a, a simple analytical solution, but you can do it yourself, you can uh, ignore in your pressure. So you are in force free conditions, the, in the pressure can be elected. The electric field is only actual, so we are looking at the station steady state solution. And this is something that you can try to verify by uh, new, new textbook of an idea of MHD stability. But your, your equilibrium depends only on one parameter. Basically, it is proportional to the electric field that you apply and it is inversely proportional to the resistivity. And uh, clearly, the um, toroidal field at the edge is the parameter by, by the, the experimentalist control by changing the current in, uh, the, in, the, in the toroidal field coils. And you have a simple ODE that you can, uh, that, that you can integrate uh, numerically. So what happens in the pinch? Basically, you drive the current by increasing the, the electric field, or whenever it uh, heats up, the, the, the resistivity decreases. And keeping the, the value at the edge constant, because it is in the coils that you are applying, the plasma in, uh, begins to, to produce a much more toroidal field inside, as long as the current grows. So the pinch is paramagnetic, and this is one of the characteristics of the toroidal uh, configuration and of, also of the reverse field pinch. So the reverse field pinch produces much of its fluxes with a small value of toroidal field at the edge. This means that you can do it and you can sustain it without superconducting coils. So this is one of the advantages of RFP, but uh, it shares and it inherited from stabilized pinch research. Unfortunately, <clears throat> what happened is that even if there some uh, improvement was obtained, still the pinch was already unstable. And this is due to the fact, uh, the very, very fact that uh, uh, in any case, the Q profile, the safety fractor profile of a, of a pinch uh, is always characterized by the presence of a minimum, basically. And the presence of this minimum is such that you can some resistive interchange uh, in, or ideal interchange instability can take place. And uh, the, the Sweden criterion of stability is always, uh, always violated because the Q prime is zero. And the fact that he, it must, be, must behave this way is very simply due to the fact that in the, uh, in the center, it should decrease due to the characteristic of the currents and uh, in the edge, it, it must increase. The only way in which you can uh, obtain uh, uh, solution to this apparent paradox is basically to have it to reverse, basically. So the idea was, okay, so we can decrease uh, continuously and increase in absolute value at the, uh, at the edge here. Or the other solution to, to solve the pinch was actually to, as you probably uh, already have seen in the last days, uh, increase the toroidal field very high. So um, uh, relying on a complex technology of uh, very high toroidal field coils. And... Uh, which is the tokamak, basically. The point is that in order to get this configuration, you have to let the toroidal field invert its direction after the discharge formation. Because actually, uh, the RFP is nice for ideal stability, but it is not consistent with Ohm's law. And now I will repeat it various times, this kind of, of figure, just to give the... the the flavor of what's going on, because in steady state, as I said, uh, the electric field of a pinch is totally axial. And so it can drive current in the toroidal direction only or, or axial direction. And uh, if you have uh, the MHD equilibrium, which is driven by the Ohm's law for, as I said, the speed of resistivity, um, the current uh, in the polar surface in particular, which is uh, with Q equals zero, is such that it is totally poloidal. So basically, the electric field is uh, orthogonal to this line. And so it cannot match. Uh, it, it cannot drive any current. You see here, basically, the, the, the comparison of the parallel current of a simple pinch with the eta j, the eta j term. They, they do not match. For, and so uh, the RFP cannot be obtained in, in a steady state. So the idea is that uh, in order to obtain at least transitly an RFP, and that was uh, in, uh, tested, attempted uh, in the 60s by Okawa, 
is basically to change rapidly the toroidal field at the coil after startup whenever you are already, uh, you, you have your pinch, which is uh, in the unstable phase, but the loop voltage is high enough so that it still survives. And then uh, after a while with a perfect timing or with an optimized timing, you reverse the current in the toroidal field coils. And so the field is going the other way around. And uh, in this way, you hope that the plasma will keep frozen this configuration. Another variant was also to drive a parallel current, so to increase the, 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 the reversal and so also reversing the loop voltage so that we have also the current in, in the direct in, in the opposite direction. Kind of overlap. How that is it relies on the time of diffusion, basically. So it, it, it was done, done very much empirically at that time, basically. So you, you have to do it fast. In fact, in the old pinches, it was so fast that the current was only flowing in, in, a, in, a, in a sheet. What happened in the last pinches is that the current penetration is anomalous. And so uh, instability is... Uh, actually it takes a place and so they make the, the current penetrate. But the essential is the fact that you have to change the toroidal field during the startup phase with a timing to be understood. Now, applying these two recipes, which is basically reversing the toroidal field after the discharge at the, the pinch setup and reversing the toroidal, the poroidal current in order to allow the reversal to obtain, actually in 68, it was reported the first results by the Zeta uh, device. It actually, it was not an RFP device. It was a device that was actually um, um, built in the 60s uh, to, to test the pinch configuration. But in the end of its life, it has been modified, actually. So they had a condenser allowing them to reverse the current very rapidly. And they also use winding in the opposite direction just to have loop voltage. Uh, sent in the opposite direction. <clears throat> and they were able to obtain during their discharges, actually not like it cannot be read very well, but it, is, it was in the milliseconds range, which was big at that time, because actually all of the small pinches were in the microsecond range, which, so which was a big machine for that time. And they reached up to 500 kiloamps in a few milliseconds. In RFX, this is the startup time, but at that time, that was a whole discharge. And it was very <clears throat> turbulent, so, the second trace here shows what was the derivative of the Rogowski signal. So basically the, the current was fluctuating wildly due to some kind of instabilities. They called them very turbulence. But uh, whenever they applied the reversal and, um, of toroidal and polyidal fields, basically we obtain a reduction, a significant reduction of these fluctuations. So the, the so-called quiescent state which lasted as long as the reversal and the easy uh, decrease was remaining there. And that was a very quiescent period that actually encouraged all of the RFP uh, research uh, came, which came after that. And there was also, uh, I forgot, it was measured actually that the, 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 the toroidal field at the end was, uh, uh, was reversed. <clears throat> Point is that it was not occurring in all pinches because not only Zeta, but also all over all, all another couple of uh, devices tried. They obtain reversal, but they do not obtain quiescence. And it uh, later on uh, resulted in the fact that even if you reverse, actually, what we are seeing here is the Q profile, but reversed. So uh, the outer side is on the left. Uh, you need to have a programming and uh, uh, um, an edge that allows to have the Q monotonically decreasing so that it is not unstable to this interchange. While in other machines, very likely, the Q was still having a minimum there and so allowing to, uh, to the instabilities to grow. And that depended on uh, recipes of the, the first world materials. So they used to be, uh, there's some timing there probably. They used to have uh, uh, quartz, so insulating in, in, instead of metal, and they were not very clean. They were field, uh, field errors. So all of the things that uh, actually made these charges very short. Motivated by this uh, 
success in uh, there were uh, several generations of rfp experiments uh, uh, going on basically the first one was the hbtx which uh, was uh, um, built by the same people from zeta actually it was a much reduced budget it was a very small machine what you see here is the minor radius and the uh, the height is the, the major radius, just to give a, an idea. So Zeta was very big, actually. It's, it's kind of comparable to modern ones. While all of the 80s, the pinches, uh, the reverse field pinches were kind of short. The second generation was in some sort of intermediate. And the last generation, which is actually the one I'm talking about and whose results we have uh, uh, summarized in uh, the last review, uh, has comp comp comprised these four ones. Actually, KTX is the last one, which uh, is a Chinese uh, experiment uh, which uh, began operation in 2015, but we are still struggling to obtain an RFP. Uh, we have some trouble talking with them. Um, well, uh, the, the various generations had a different time scales. So, but some ideas about um, the RFP were born uh, having in mind the experiments and the experimental findings of these small machines. And so, when we talk about relaxation, uh, when we talk about Dynamo, they were thinking about this, some kind of experiments. Now they have been adapted to different uh, experimental findings, but it is useful just to to uh, give a look at the past and see what an RFP looked like at that time. Now, that I spent some time recovering what it was, let me just tell you how we describe an equilibrium parameter, an equilibrium we, we use some kind of parameters. And so um, the RFP equilibrium is basically represented in terms of measurements that you can do outside, so electromagnetic measurement. The first, uh, the first parameter theta is called the pinch parameter, and this is an in, in, inherited from theta theta pinch research. It changes its meaning a little bit. So whenever I was looking at very old papers, theta was meaning a slightly different. So it was uh, it was connected to what was the toroidal field applied before the discharge. While whenever the discharges get longer and longer, it it becomes the, 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 the flux being produced during the plasma. But in any case. Uh, it's a normalization of a plasma current to the flux, to the toroidal flux, which is, which is measured and produced by the plasma. And theta after the theta pinch or after the theta, the theta component. The new parameter, which characterizes the, the RFP and which was not present at the time of a theta pinch is the field reversal, which is F. And uh, which is very present the, the edge value of the toroidal field com normalized to the average value. So at the plasma breakdown, so whenever you are in vacuum, this number is one, while uh, theta is zero because uh, the, the plasma has no current. And uh, another important parameter is the safety factor Q, which is the ratio of BZ of BT. Clearly on Q, you will lose the information about the, the flux, the flux which is uh, uh, being produced by the plasma. Now, uh, characteristics of all of the RFP experiments from the old ones up to now uh, is that they, uh, they, they can be described, their time evolution during the discharge can be described by the F theta diagram. The F-data diagram means that no matter how big or small is your RFP machines, uh, or also a pinch, um, uh, the, the time trace of the F-data parameters on this, play, on this plane will eventually get to some kind of universal curve. So at, uh, at the beginning, you are here. So basically, no plasma, no current. The toroidal field applied from outside is exactly equal to the, uh, to the average, so one zero. Then the current grows. The plasma begins to be paramagnetic, so it produces its flux, and it goes somewhere here. And uh, you see here a, a first characteristic that characterizes the RFP is that something happens whenever the current grows. So you have to go to high current. You cannot scale simply to uh, to more small current because in order to have it uh, reverse, you have to 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 go above some kind of threshold. 
And in this case, in case of normalized the coordinates and theta is 1.4, 1.5. Now, whenever we were talking about the old experiments, the small one, they were characterized by this violent instability because actually they, whenever they, you, are, you switch on the plasma, theta is equal almost zero, F equal to, it is unstable because it is a Q profile with a, with a, with a minimum. And then the first idea that came to the people was, okay, let's go fast. If we use uh, condensers that go faster than the instability, we can make the plasma grow so fast that it will uh, uh, go uh, burn through, say, the, 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 the unstable um, the unstable period. And then we will go in the, uh, the reverse uh, stable uh, and quiescent phase. But uh, whenever you do it, this, uh, so fast uh, you had so profile current profiles so um, concentrated in the edge but they tended to be uh, with a very high theta low f and so uh, they tend to violently relax to a curve in f theta so depending on how you adjust the timing of the reversal of the toroidal field and the polyoidal field it turns out that uh, they were always referring to some kind of curve in this f theta space and if you if your startup was such that you were getting far, far from that curve then with a very time fast time scale it was relaxing there so the terms of relaxation was 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 um, invented at that time i, I think while machines, bigger machines, which cannot go fast because you cannot go fast on a more small machine, tend to stay on that curve for, 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 for the whole startup. And here has the name of self-reversal of the machine. RFX and RFX mod actually do exactly the same thing. So these are time traces uh, from more, more recent one well, from RFX mod. And uh, they all trace the same trajectory in the startup phase uh, from 300 kiloamps to 1.5 megaamps. So this is very, very general. And such a behavior was empirically observed to depend and to be described by the so-called Bessel function model, which is very simple um, in, in uh, cylindrical geometry. Again, you take your equilibrium, uh, MSD equilibrium, you take it uh, with, uh, um, without pressure, because in the startup phase, uh, the pressure is negligible. The plasma is conducting, but it is not playing that much role. And this implies that uh, the gradient of B is proportional to B. So the current is proportional to the, car to the field everywhere. But you allow it to, in principle, be different from uh, surface to surface. But you, if you further assume uh, absolutely legally, empirically at that time, that was already recognized, uh, that uh, this constant, is, this mu is not radially de depending, but it is constant. Um, it gives you a solution which is unacceptable from an experimentalist point of view because it tells you that you have a finite current which is flowing into, into the edge. So there's something to adjust. But uh, still, if you uh, work out the details of, of this uh, equation in, a, in, cylindrical, uh, in cylindrical geometry, it turns out that it is analytical. So it is the, uh, the Bessel functions, uh, hence the name, basically, which all depends on one parameter, which is the, 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 the proportionality between the current and the, uh, the, the, the toroidal field. And also in this case, if you increase this number mu, above some kind of threshold, you obtain a solution which resembles the RFP. Actually, it was recognized that it was resembling also to the pinch. So it dates back in the years. So, and it was inherited from some astrophysical uh, uh, papers in which these uh, force-free fields uh, were used to describe this kind of, uh, of uh, astrophysical phenomena. I'm presenting the Bessel function model before the explanation of it, because actually when I was a student, it was confusing me a lot. Uh, so that's why I prefer to, to do it this way, but probably someone would not be agree with me. But from a, Yeah, in fact, they were around, uh, lying around for a long time. So empirically, as an experimentalist, I'm happy. I have something which represents my data. I take it, I buy it. Whenever I let two experimentalists to explain why. 
now in fact we were unhappy about the fact that mu was constant at the edge and so it was empirically modified and so allowing it to be constant in the in the in the core and the decreasing at the edge so if you work out the details uh, you obtain the alpha theta zero model which we are still using today in these days just to represent uh, uh, the equilibrium in order to do some kind of uh, say remapping computation uh, idea stability and so on and so forth and at first uh, justification very very coarse justification of why is it, it should, could be is uh, by introducing the concept of stochasticity and introducing it for the first time i will give you some basic ideas uh, later on in the uh, lecture on um, on transport but may, at this stage we only need to know that uh, a magnetic field uh, which is stochastic if uh, the lines wander radially instead of, uh, of, per, uh, of describing uh, nested torre so basically it cannot sustain a pressure because uh, the pressure is equilibrated along these surfaces this would justify why the current is proportional to the to the to, to the field and uh, as the current is divergence free basically and as this mu constant should be should vary um, perpendicularly to to be the only possibility is that whenever you have a region in which you have stochasticity mu should be constant along that region but if you have a region outside which is not stochastic anymore, then you can allow mu to, to change. And so this, this very simple argument about how this alpha theta zero and mu um, um, profile can be going to zero at the edge, it was satisfactory for us. But for the, for the theoretician, it was not satisfactory, which is, which is correct. So... <clears throat> And now I have them touching the Taylor's theory, which is still at the center of a debate uh, in these days. And people, in fact, is, are calling this a uh, conjecture instead of a theory. And so Taylor basically tried to, to borrow uh, experiment ideas uh, from, uh, from theory to, to explain this BFM and the fact that this new profile was constant. And so his relaxation trigger is trying to prove why the BFM works so effectively, basically. But it is still, as I said, called a conjecture. And I will say you why in a few minutes. Now, the idea is that uh, in, uh, in, a, in, in the plasma, the, there is a conserved quantity, which is called the magnetic helicity. Now, I am not an expert now. This elicity is difficult to, to visualize unless you see some nice picture. It is the noctedness of the, of the field. If the, the, the plasma is a completely ideal, all of the flux tubes are conserved. So if you stretch, twist them, they, this quantity on every, on every flux tube is conserved. But this is ideal MHT, and the plasma is not ideal. There is a tiny amount of resistivity. So its conjecture is the fact that uh, uh, whenever you have the resistivity, you have a tearing of lines. So you are still, again, some kind of stochasticity, so that uh, the flux tube do not retain their individual um, character. And so each uh, elicity on each flux tube is not conserved anymore. But... Uh, he assumes that only a global helicity is conserved. This is an answer, basically. So let's say you have your plasma, which is stochastic, but it is contained in a flux container, so in, in a perfectly conductor. And so that only this surface is the one which is very well defined. And so only the integral over, over the whole plasma of the helicity is conserved. Ah, yeah, it is wrong. I have to correct it. So... Let's state that the plasma will reach, uh, at the end of its, its evolution, it will tend to get to a state in which the, the energy is the minimum, so the, the magnetic energy is minimum, but in which, uh, but, but keeping the magnetic helicity constant. So it is a constraint minimization. So it, once you charge your system because you have uh, used some kind of loop voltage or some, something going on, 
by, by a very simple uh, variational uh, Lagrange multiplier um, argument, you obtain a solution in which you minimize uh, energy, keeping the constraint of helicity, it ends up in the BFM. So your Lagrange multiplier is this BFM. So now I'm clearly really oversimplifying it, but that's basically it. So the fact that uh, given these answers, you obtain the BFM, then the fact that the BFM uh, represents pretty well your experimental data and your experimental profile was taken as a proof, because actually if you increase uh, theta and mu below, no, above a certain threshold, it reverses. And so this is usually presented as, as the proof of the Taylor's theory. And more and then he, he elaborated more on that. Uh, ah, and I, I told you that uh, if you want to, to get some more results, no more detail on that, it, they, they are very nice uh, presented in some lectures. No, let me go back in some lectures by Dalton Schnack that uh, he published in 2009. He spent a few lectures in going into the details of uh, how it was. Uh, uh, obtain and which were actually the, the delicate point which cannot be proved actually as yet uh, there is no rigorous proof of a Taylor's theory even if it has been measured in fact I've seen uh, a second in a second paper Taylor actually raised some arguments about the fact that the helicity should decay at a different speed in terms of the Lundquist number which rules the MSD turbulence uh, uh, different from from my energy and actually this was measured in uh, in MST and in some particular conditions actually you do see if you measure the energy if you measure the LCD you really do see that uh, the energy decreases and the LCD is, con is uh, conserved but still it is an heuristic argument because actually the point is that Taylor had in mind um, uh, micro turbulence so small scale while we will see later on uh, most of the rfp dynamics uh, can be explained in terms of global modes so they are not cascades uh, they are not uh, going from big scale to small scale still some of the arguments can, can, are, are applicable but still there is some debate probably Professor Swadesh know much more than me about that. Point is that the RFP, the Taylor's theory does not tell you anything about uh, dynamics. So it can give you only the minimum state with which, uh, toward which the system will, uh, will go. But uh, uh, how are you going to go there? And also, how is it being to sustained? So the, the, the issue of the, 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 the the lacking uh, poloidal current uh, is still there. So what is driving the poloidal current in the edge, in, in, the, in the reversal surface? And here comes another idea, which is parallel to the idea of, of Taylor, which is the concept of a turbulent dynamo or the dynamo field, which is about in the same years, basically. And the idea is that, uh, okay, let's imagine that uh, you have uh, your RFP plasma, which has some kind of turbulence and which can be split in two parts. So you have your equilibrium, B0, and they're fluctuating with some part, uh, with some uh, zero average, either in space or in time, so undetected, uh, un undefined. Um, and if you, if you write down your Ohm's law, actually it, it turns out that your Ohm's law has a new term. So at least uh, the, the zero part of the Ohm's law, not the fluctuating part, uh, there's a term which is order zero. So which is fluctuation times across uh, fluctuation velocity, fluctuation uh, uh, magnetic field. And so Ohm's law is modified by turbulence. Uh, a generic turbulence and so you have an additional term which is the right term that you need to drive a volatile current if you if you're in VRP. the dynamo field is something that you see in the literature every every time basically point is that uh, whenever you do some kind of statistical analysis or statistical description of your uh, of your turbulence you have to do some kind of uh, uh, see simplifying assumptions at that time, now I'm not going to go into these details. 
um, by assuming that the VMC turbulence had some very simply homogeneous isotropic properties, uh, an alpha dynamo effect, uh, what was brought, uh, borrowed by, by uh, astrophysics, uh, can be introduced. And basically, in astrophysics, you have flows uh, in the core of the, of the stars, of the planets, uh, but are that are driving uh, the, the, the material and uh, also generating a magnetic field. And it turns out that Gimlet was able, with this alpha dynamo effect, with very simplifying assumption, to obtain the BFM again. And so, in principle, this is also a proof of the fact that Gimlet theory is correct, because actually, uh, we, with his assumption about uh, turbulence and uh, alpha dynamo effect, uh, he obtained a representation of uh, this field. Um, also, there was some kind of time dynamics. But the problem, as I said, is the fact that it borrowed the ideas from astrophysics in which the flow determines the magnetic field, while in the RFP, beta is very high, so flow and field are very tight together, so there is no back reaction. So from this theory, the idea was, is just to come out with the idea that there, there exists some MSD dynamo, so there is some dynamo field, and in fact, that's why the global modes that are responsible for the sustainment are sometimes termed the dynamo modes. Now, without dynamo field, what happens is that an RFP actually would decay. It's another way of saying what I've already shown you several times. So there is no electric field, no Ohm's law that can sustain an RFP. Uh, but in the second generation RFP devices, actually the plasma was there. So uh, it didn't know, but it was there. So uh, it can be sustained for a, as long as you apply loop voltage. If you do classically, so actually I'm not going to into the details of the solution of the, the PDAs of uh, uh, transport, basically, but the parametric pinch with the, with the um, time dependence uh, of uh, induction, which is done by Karaman in 84, it states that uh, if you have an initial RFP configuration, which is uh, depicted here, and you let it um, evolve classically under the resistivity and uh, the flow which is pinching, uh, Basically, the, 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 the RFP will decay away, so the, it will get uh, more and more deep, and it, it eventually will, uh, will be lost. So uh, in cylindrical geometry, axisymmetry, and uh, with a pure ohm law without a dynamo field, the RFP cannot be sustained. Le recognize the fact that there were not... Uh, uh, Poloidal currents, some experimental technique have been uh, tested just to see if we can replace from outside the missing current. And uh, so um, it has been attempted by our colleague in MST in Madison to use the inductive field to uh, induce car poloidal current or using insertable electrical guns or, or waves. And uh, the idea is just depicted here. So if you drive some parallel current and you change the mu, so the, the parallel current, uh, in principle, you can try to mimic what was actually done by Zeta, basically. So <laughs> they, they reversed the, the poroidal field and the toroidal field. And this is what the, the PPCD, I will talk about that uh, later on. Just to mention, no, MHD was not the only possible solution about uh, what drives this poloidal current. Uh, there was an idea brought about uh, by the American colleagues of the 8040 that uh, it is fast electrons. Again, there is stochasticity. Stochasticity makes the, this electron flow along these lines. Uh, and if they are um, in a number, in a sufficient number, they can drive the, poly the required poloidal current. There were some measurements in the old experiments showing that actually fast electrons, so electrons with energies typically of the core, were in the edge. They were not typical of the temperature measured the edge. But in RFX, by tracking the, the 
the trajectory of a, of a frozen pellet injected into the plasma and they they computed its its deflection it is deflected due to the fact that but whenever your 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 frozen pellet is in the plasma it is bombarded from the ion side and the electron side and the, by the difference of these two parts there is a rocket effect and so you can be quantitative and you can compute with deflection and with deflection if the fast electrons were there the fast electrons are required to drive the current that you need it would have been deflected too much so the deflection was a, there was a lack of deflection and so that's why in rfx the kinetic dynamo time theory is not applicable so probably also in high in bigger experiments but in the smaller who knows it also it depends on the density regime so so the final uh, um, explanation of why uh, the, the RFP self-reverses was a numerical simulation. So basically, instead of doing analytic, you try to use uh, the full transport code, the full viscoresistive code. And what I'm showing here, I'm not an expert in this field, but uh, what is instructive is looking at the very, very first uh, simulation, which was based on the same code, which was used by Western and Sachs, uh, to simulate the, the tokamak uh, so teeth and they try to do uh, what uh, try to see what happens in a plasma um, in a pinch and let it evolve with some uh, arbitrary choice of energy losses but the idea was that uh, let it be unstable let the mode grow but uh, this mode grows so fast that as it was in a, in a, con a flux conserver it reverses the field and so some reversal is obtained and this reversal is uh, is sustained later on by several other modes which comes on so it was not actually an accurate simulation but the idea was that uh, global modes could play the role of the 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 mhd turbulence actually and from this on actually all of the results, all of the research on RFP was basically based on the uh, investigations of global modes. And so now I'm going to, to give you, which is the phenomenology of the global modes. So I'm starting from the, basically the, what is contained in the, in the, in the RFP review, in the last RFP review. Global modes, which in RFB are M equal one and M equal zero, as in the old pinches, basically. And these are basically um, M equal one and uh, several N modes, uh, which are resonant into the core. So there's a, a bunch of modes, there's a bunch of resonances of M equal one, and M equal zeros are all resonating at, at the reversal surface. And um, these magnetic fluctuations, these were called, you will see also, they, these um, global modes also named magnetic fluctuations. And this is due to the fact that uh, it was discovered in the 80s, basically, that they were due to global modes because they did the correlation analysis of several pickup coils and trying to figure out uh, uh, the global structure with, with a Fourier spectrum. Now it's obvious that you take multiple measurements, you take a Fourier analysis and you, you get the mode. At that time, it was not that obvious. And uh, they are resonant mode, also not dubbed dynamo modes or tearing modes. Tearing because actually they drive islands. This is a simple example uh, taken from the Western, you, you probably already know that uh, a resonant mode with a radial field different from zero at the, at the resonant surface can drive an island, basically. And so a tearing mode. And we will have some experimental examples of this kind of islands seen in RFPs. So global modes in RFP tend to manifest themselves in two different ways of... Um, uh, of spectrum basically so yeah, in multiple helicity we have many global m equal one and m equal zero modes this is a time trace of an rfx mod uh, discharge for example in blue there are high-end modes and in red there is a dominant mode basically what happens is that uh, uh, in some regimes uh, all the modes are together similar so they're slowly decaying uh, decaying um, spectrum uh, as here and in some cases they tend to grow and remain high and so it gives you one mode dominating over the others and these are called single quasi single helicity and we are widely different phenomenologies the multiple helicity phenomenology 
was uh, studied uh, basically in all the all discharges in the, all the experiments and the quasi singularities emerged emerged only in, in from the 90s from the 2000 basically uh, multiple elasticity tended to have uh, uh, non-linear phenomena between these modes uh, they manifested themselves uh, in terms of uh, 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 increasing and whenever they add uh, they increase together, they tend to induce a sort of crashes, dynamo. So they were not uh, stationary so solutions. And these, connect these, these events were also connected to the regeneration of flux. So it is what flow called uh, SOTIF. This kind of uh, behavior in the multiple LST is important because basically most of the production of the MST experiment is based on ensemble averaging of measurements along reproducible this, uh, this dynamic uh, reconnection events. And this is due to the fact that there is cascades of these modes which uh, interact. And um, they tend to increase and then they release, this is some kind of reconnection, then there is some kind of release of flux and so on. In particular, as I mentioned earlier, there were measurements of elicity and uh, energy during a sotif in order to verify the Taylor's uh, conjecture. So the fact that during a relaxation event, uh, the elicity is conserved while uh, the energy is decreased. And within the experimental uncertainties, in that particular case, this is really happening. Also, during this sort of, uh, during this sort of, they had to measure the dynamo field. And so, by directly measuring the, the fluctuation of velocity and fluctuation of uh, magnetic field, we were able to compare it with the parallel current and the parallel electric field, and they matched pretty well. So in multiple helicity, uh, also you can have an MSD dynamo, which comes from these global modes, which are, uh, which are defined and measured. Another characteristic of, uh, of a multiple elicity is the fact that all of these modes tend to phase lock together. This is another nonlinear behavior, which makes it more complex to deal with them. And uh, they tend to be not to, be re to, to remain near the resonance, but they are global mode. They also deform, they also deform the last closed surface. And as they are lining up together, all together, they tend to deform in a totally localized region, which tend to interact with the plasma. Oh gosh. It tends to interact with the plasma. And you see here that if you look with a camera from the toroidal view, you can see some kind of helical interaction. And this actually was kind of difficult to deal with in RFX, especially. Now I've seen that it is 55. Now I think I can stop here and let the second part at the 11. So because otherwise it will be too long. Okay, sorry. Thank you. Any questions? Any presentation that I just pointed the from my understanding that as far as I have understood it, we apply a Yes. And uh, because of the plasma current in which colloidal magnetic fields are generated. Yes, because actually, whenever you have you, you induce the current, uh, you have yes. a specific. So, in this case, we have to apply an external magnetic field uh, and we apply it from it. You and need a small one. So, the, the, just like in the pinches. So, you need a toroidal field to, to delivered from the outside. So, the seed is actually required. But it is not big, it is not dominant. So you have a more small total field from the outside, so the, the coils are not that huge. And then the plasma produces much of its total field inside. And the helicity is quantized for different values of n, which will uh, show that the different modes. For n, n, because at n equal one, n equal zero, and the various n depending on the Q profile, basically. So, yes. Mm -hmm. 
And m equals zero basically it means some kind of rings. Uh, I will show you something in the second the second lecture. So it is not a it is not a helix, but uh, it's some kind of uh, yes, some kind of rings just like that. Any time a given quantum number is zero, it means there's no deviation in the Yeah. Any time a very different kind of a beast that you are uh, to expose to. So it's uh, uh, physics wise, extremely interesting whether it becomes uh, a candidate for a fusion or not. But it's very interesting. Well, the fact that it does not scale. So if you increase a parameter, it changes its shape. And so you cannot apply the same tools, even if you can. But uh, the V cross B in a helical case, it, it, it assumes a different meaning. Right. I mean, the plasma is kind of trying to do its own thing. Yeah. And uh, that can be put in the What's the rule of the magnitude for reverse current? Yeah. What's the role of a magnetic field? Yeah. The reversing current actually in uh, in zeta they were trying to reverse the the, the e zeta just to help the the current and to, to keep the q without the minimum. And in some experiments in MSD, they see that the, if whenever they are decreasing the current and if they apply a further far a further colloidal reverse. Um, electric field they reduce the amplitude of these modes basically so i'm not sure if they answer your question but we can, we can discuss later extremely magnetic configuration right so you know uh, the what, magnetic what? field plays just as important a part in any other you know, what, what the magnetic field is produced differently its behavior is very different Yes, yeah. yes. But, but, but what I'm thinking is uh, there is a toroidal magnetic field. So for that toroidal magnetic field, uh, it auto-induces some kind of current. Maybe it gets out, out of the toroidal. Whenever it changes. Also, uh, another uh, reverse magnetic field that opposes this change. Yes. So we may have the, it depends on the, the, on, the, on the conductor if you have gaps or if you have no gaps. So, so yeah, in transient, it's a nightmare to compute. Yes, sure. Right, so if for the time being, what was the externally applied field, then the toroidal and the magnetic and polar and magnetic field are connected. They're not independent. Yeah. There is uh, one goes as a uh, Bessel function zero, the other goes as Bessel function one of the same parameter. So there's a deep connectivity. They're not independent parameters, like uh, for instance, the my point of view. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, all right, so I will just make uh, one request to all of you. Please try to be here five minutes before or five minutes after. Right. Okay, so that allows us to start changing time. And it's just being respectful to.